Well, good evening, everybody. Pastor Jason here at Ravenna Church of the Nazarene for our online Bible study through the book of Hebrews. It's called The Jesus Supremacy. Uh, that We're going to be in chapter 6, looking at verses 1 through 8 in this video. Um, if you haven't joined us in person, uh, I invite you to do so. We meet on Wednesday nights at 6.30 here at the Ravenna Church of the Nazarene Fellowship Hall. And we just have an, it's the same study we're doing here online, but it's more of a group discussion as we're going through this book. Um, if it's your first time watching one of our videos in the Book of Hebrews, welcome. I'm glad you're watching. This is the, this is the, any place is a good place to start, but I would encourage you at some point to go back and watch the other videos to kind of pick up some maybe some details that, that I don't necessarily cover in this week's section. Um... Or perhaps maybe you a person, someone who attends the in-person study, or, or you're wanting to, uh, if you want to be caught up with this, that's what these videos are for. Uh, it's just, to, to, again, to share the same information, but in a way that if you miss a week, you can still be caught up. Now, right now, our video series is running about two weeks behind the in-person study, but, but that's okay. We'll get caught up here at some point. All right, with that being said, we're going to jump right into chapter 6, and and this chapter begins with a warning, and it's come, this warning is in 6... At the beginning here is coming right after a harsh observation the writer of Hebrews had in chapter 5 to end it out, right? And he has this observation that the Hebrew Christians, um, the Hebrew Christians have become lazy in their faith. Now, it's a detour from what the writer is attempting to establish. He's trying to establish that Jesus is a high priest superior both in office and order than that of Aaron. But while the, uh, the writer is giving them this warning here, and after fall, in the beginning of 6 and kind of continuing his harsh observation, uh, he's, uh, as he's admonishing these believers, uh, he's not going to leave them in defeat. Um, we as believers do not live in defeat, but in victory through Jesus Christ. And that is the point of this, in, this entire letter. So we're going to jump right in here to our text. Uh, verse 1 says, So let's press on to maturity. By moving on from the basics about Christ's word, let's not lay a foundation of turning away from dead works of faith in God. So during my time in the service, the army had a, a process to how they trained you. It was, it was called the crawl, walk, run method. And the idea is you had to learn to crawl before you could walk. And then you had to learn to walk before you could run. And even after learning to run, you had to learn to perform under adverse conditions. So as a soldier, I, I was expected to not remain in the crawl phase, but move on to the walk phase, and then inevitably the run. And um, I, I served as a combat medic, right? And so what they would do to teach us how to do the different treatments we had to perform, uh, they, they would first show us through instruction, right? They, and they would go step by step on how to do the procedure. Then they would have us do it with them watching, but again, going step by step. That way we're learning how to do it properly and, and, and whatnot. And then we would do it by ourselves, again, uh, with a little bit faster, without the sergeant correcting us along the way, uh, but waiting until the end to do so. And then inevitably we, just, we had to run it, right? We had to actually perform the task under evaluation. And then uh, I, I remember we were doing a mass casualty situation, and I was charged to be the head medic for the mass cow and the first time I did it you know when I talk about learning to run under under conditions right I had already been through the procedure of crawl walk and run but when I had when I was trying to run it to simulate the intensity of being in a combat zone or a or an environment like this the sergeant stood right here in my face stood right up next to me and was screaming at me the whole time as I'm trying to direct my team and on, on how to treat the casualties and you can imagine it did not go very well. But later on, I was given the opportunity to lead the same team, uh, uh, another team of medics in the same scenario, and it went much smoother, right? Because the sergeant had prepared me by, for those adverse circumstances by standing right here. But, so when I actually came time to do it in, in a more simulated environment, uh, I was able to do so. Uh, so that, that's kind of the, the gist of the, the crawl, walk, run method. And, um, and that's kind of how it is with our faith, right? We, we have to first be born again from above, right? We have to place our faith in Jesus. And then we have to, to crawl in that faith in the beginning, right? And, and then we begin to walk, and then soon we begin to run and begin to run under adverse circumstances. Uh, so our faith is ever growing, ever maturing in Jesus, right? Um, we have that initial moment of salvation where we're born again. 
And then we're going to have another moment where we're going to have that recognition that we have something wrong with us as we're trying to live for God. And that's where we believe uh, we, we enter this crisis of entire sanctification where we recognize our need for the Holy Spirit to be in control of our lives. And we, so we yield ourselves completely to God by faith and His Spirit begins to direct us. And that's when we begin to run in our faith. And with the Spirit's help, we learn to run under those adverse, those adverse conditions. Now, the Hebrew Christians knew that Jesus had died on the cross. They knew he had rose again. That's why they had faith. They knew that it was Jesus, it was their faith in Jesus, that their sins were washed away by his blood. This understanding is important. But at some point, they were expected to learn the why, the what, and the how, and the who. And all the scripture points to the necessity of Jesus and our need for him, for, and our need for salvation through him. And so uh, if we love Jesus, and if the Hebrew Christians love Jesus, their love for Jesus should compel, compel them to study and wrestle with, with what the meanings and connections and applications are, that are revealed through the Bible. And, this, and again, it's the same for us. When we are studying God's word, it's not just to, to fill our head with knowledge, but it's, it's helping us to understand our faith and then be able to live out that faith in Jesus. Uh, W.T.B. Kreiser writes, It means leaving them as a child leaves the ABCs to go on to reading or leaves the multiplication table to go on to arithmetic and algebra. Moving forward from the elementary understanding is not an optional part of our faith, but evidence of growing in our love for Christ. Uh, failure to move forward is to take all, all the, those all-important foundational elements of faith and turn them into sinking sand. Right, Christianity is one of those faiths where if you're not growing in grace, if you're not growing in your in your understanding of Christ, uh, you're not you're actually going backwards. Uh, John MacArthur said, stated that they are they are the place to start. Those elementary things of, of faith is what he's talking about. They are the place to start, not stop. They are the gate of entrance on the road of salvation in Christ. Thomas Aquinas adds, in the way of God, not to progress, is to fall back. And so again, throughout this book of Hebrews, we talked about this, uh, you know, we are saved through our faith in Jesus, but we can choose to walk away from that faith. We can, we can fall into apostasy, right? It's, it's not that this, the blood of Jesus isn't strong enough. It's not that Jesus and the Holy Spirit in us isn't strong enough to keep us in the faith. It's by our own decisions, right? And so if we're loving God and we're pursuing knowledge of Him and we're growing in His grace, then we're going to be moving forward, not backwards, not standing still. We, we, see, we serve a God that's always on the move. We talk about how the Holy Spirit is at work in my heart. He's at work in your heart. He's always active. He's always on the go. And if we're filled with His Holy Spirit, the same is going to happen to us. We're always going to be moving forward in His Spirit. And um, So growing... Growing in Jesus, growing in our faith, is an important part of faith in Jesus. All right, moving on to verses 2 and 3. It says, Of teaching about ritual ways to wash the water, laying on of hands, the resurrection from the dead, and eternal judgment all over again. So he's talking about the elementary teachings again. We're going to press on if God allows. So verse 2, the writer is giving us a list of the elementary things taught at the beginning of a person's faith. Right? We're... We, uh, one of the first things we do as a new believer in Jesus is we, we, we go through the ritual of baptism. Water baptism is important. It, sim it symbolizes the, the inward work of the Holy Spirit through grace, but it expressed outwardly as a public announcement of faith. Essentially, a baptism is a coming out party for Christians. As important as the ritual is, though, why water? Water. And how does it connect it with salvation as a whole? Right, that, and, and so, so we, we understand we should get baptized, but as we grow in our faith and our understanding, right, we're going we're gonna to understand why we do that ritual. And we're going to understand why we urge others to, to do the same thing. The resurrection from the dead, right? We, we, that's a foundational understanding of the work of Jesus. But what does that imply to his followers? Eternal judgment is, is the thing that Jesus has saved us from. But why does it have to be that way? You see, the, the lazy and the cop-out answer we can give is because God in his word says so. 
But a heart that loves God is going to dig for the deeper answers. It's not just going to stop at, at, at well, the God, God in his word says so. Again, that's important. I'm not denying the authority of Scripture. I'm not denying the importance of Scripture. But Scripture even goes beyond that. It reveals why those, those rituals and things are necessary. It, it reveals why Jesus had to be resurrected from the dead. It reveals why that's important to us as believers. It, it reveals to us why the eternal judgment ha- ha- it has to happen, why we had to be saved from it. So that's what we learn when we dig into the scriptures, when we, when we, when we lean into our faith in Jesus. And when we love him, it's going to compel us to take those steps, to walk deeper. Uh, Richard S. Taylor writes this, he says, These items con- constitute virtually the whole of the gospel in many churches today, with the result that most Christians never reach beyond the first grade in spiritual matters. So what t- Taylor is suggesting is that ch- churches that stay focused on elementary teachings will bring people to, to eternal life through Jesus. And that's great, that's important. But it never brings them to living to the, living to the fullest of what life has to offer. Right? Jesus didn't die on the cross to save us of our sins for us to just simply wait here to be taken up in the rapture or to, to die and go be with him. It, 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 those things are important. Those are the blessings and the hopes that we have as Christians. But the life that Jesus calls to is a full life here as citizens of his kingdom. And as we dig into the scripture and we wrestle with it, we become to understand what that means and how to live it out. Um, this is, and that, that's what... The, the responsibility is falls on the, the preachers and the teachers of the church. Uh, they're to seek the, uh, the the Holy Spirit understanding where the hearts are on the spiritual journey in, in, in their local context. And the only way you can do that is by getting to know people and by meeting them where they're at. So, you know, a church primarily consisting of those who are already follower, followers do not need those elementary teachings all over again. Those things are important. They should be taught still because you're, hopefully your, your church is bringing in people from the outside, so you, they need to hear that, that message afresh and anew. But those that are already followers, they don't need those elementary teachings. That's, that's the milk that the writer of Hebrews is referring to. They need the heavier foods. They're hungry for the heavier foods. And embracing the heavier foods will compel them into the streets. Right, the heavier. It, it, that's what happened to the disciples on the day of Pentecost. Right, they they had walked with Jesus. Right, the walk phase. Jesus, Jesus turned them loose briefly while he was with them and had them come back. A little bit of the run. Then Jesus died and rose again, and then he opened the scriptures up to him, and then they wait in that upper room. But Acts 2 tells us after they've been waiting and gathering that upper like Jesus commanded, that's when the Holy Spirit descended upon them, and that's what drove them into the streets. They began to take in those heavier foods and apply it to their lives. And then as you study the book of Acts as a whole, you begin to see how the Holy Spirit is not just at work through them, but at work in them. You think of Peter in Acts 10, right? He has that dream about... You know, God's telling him, "Don't call something unclean that I've called clean." Right, and and, and it's and Peter's like, I, "I would never eat these foods that are unclean." But it, that wasn't the message. It wasn't just about foods. It was about God was telling him, "Hey, share this message with everybody, not just with the Jews, but share it with the Gentiles as well." And lo and behold, Peter wakes up from that dream, and where does the Spirit lead him? It leads him to the house of Cornelius. He he took in the heavier foods. And that drove him into the streets. And when the when the followers of Jesus go into the streets, seek, thus seeking to yield a new harvest of believers, they're going to find others and share the message with them. And, and that's going to lead them to Jesus. It's going to lead them to that harvest of new believers. And those new believers will need the elementary teachings. They already know. But they'll be able to teach them and walk them through it. Because they know it for themselves. All right, moving on to verses 4, 5, and 6. Verses 4, 5, and 6. Because it's impossible to restore people to change hearts and lives or turn away once, they have seen the light, tasted the heavenly gift, and become partners with the Holy Spirit, and tasted God's good word and the powers of the coming age. They are crucifying God's Son all over again and exposing Him to public shame. So the warning in verses 4 through 6 
it's kind of a hypothetical situation. But this does not mean that the danger is imaginary. Again, the, the writer of Hebrews at the end of 5 points out that the Hebrew Christians have become stuck in their faith, that they've become lazy and not so, so, sought to walk deeper in their faith with, with Jesus. And then he opens up this chapter, imploring them to take that step and what that means. And, and now here in 4 5, he's giving them a warning. And, and, and these, these words go, be, go beyond simple backsliding, uh, beyond a temporary slip-up. This is describing someone who has the knowledge of Jesus and salvation, but after knowing Jesus, they decide they want more than Jesus has to offer, or they cannot get over some perceived grievance God has committed against them. So they deliberately decide to walk away. They choose to walk away. Again, no one falls away from Jesus. Uh, let me rephrase this. A common phrase we often heard, I think I've probably used it in one of these videos before, is that one sin can keep you out of heaven, right? And, that, and there's truth in that, right? You know, uh, Jesus didn't die on the cross for, you know, and, and shed his blood to just simply cover our sins up. He, he rose again so we can live in freedom and choose not to sin. Um. But here's the thing, if you love Jesus, when you mess up that one time, you know it. You're convicted by the Holy Spirit. And that conviction of the Holy Spirit in our lives is what leads us to repentance. But then repentance leads us to turn from that what led us to sin in the first place and to grow in the grace and the knowledge of God and move past that mistake, to grow beyond it. Backsliding starts because we refuse to acknowledge that sin or also because but, but, but kind of the path that leads us to that though, is this decision to stop growing in our faith, to stop seeking God and the things of God. And that's ultimately the, what, what leads us susceptible to sin and walking away. Again, the term for this is apostasy. It's, it's meaning the abandonment of, or renunciation of a religious or political belief. Now, impossible is the English word used in verse 4 to describe a person in this state. And the idea of them leaving, then returning. That word impossible in the Greek means without strength, impotent, powerless, weakly disa disabled, unable to be undone. Now, God is the Almighty. So it, it would not make sense that God would be powerless to forgive and restore a follower who has fallen into apostasy. That doesn't line up with Scripture. That doesn't line up with the knowledge of who God is. But this has more to do with the individual who has fallen away. Uh, a, a good example of this is Judas. Remember, Judas did not, uh, betrays Jesus, and, and kind of parallel to that, we have, the, we have Simon Peter, right? Peter, he, he denies Jesus three times, but the difference between the two of them is, is, is Peter goes to Jesus and seeks forgiveness. He seeks forgiveness for his denial of Jesus. But Judas had his heart so hardened by his betrayal of Jesus that Judas was unable to even reconcile with himself, let alone with God. Right? What? Uh, it was, in, if you read the text, I can't remember which of the Gospels it is off the top of my head here right now. But Jesus says to his disciples, you know, it's a, you know, it's something along the lines of, "It's better for the one who betrays the Son to have a millstone tied around his neck." Right? And and you would you read that and you think, well, Jesus is saying, if you betray Jesus, there's no coming back. But that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that to Judas to warn Judas because why? He knows Judas. He knows Judas' heart. He knows Judas' mind. He knows if Judas gets up from that table and walks out the door, that Judas isn't going to be able to forgive himself. So Jesus is trying to convince Judas to not, to not go. Again, Judas does not have to betray Jesus for the story of the crucifixion to take place. That was going to happen. That was that God had prophesied it. God had made certain that Jesus was going to die as atonement for our sins. That's throughout the Old Testament scripture. Judas had a choice in this, but G Judas chose to betray Jesus. And when he got up and left that table, his heart was so hard that when the time came and he recognized the evil he had done, he couldn't forgive himself. And when we can't forgive ourselves, we can't hear God calling out to us for offering us the forgiveness He has for us. Forgiveness and grace were a breath away from Judas, but he was unwilling and unable to see it. And I say that because, remember, when Jesus is giving us the greatest commandment, right? He says, um, 
he tells us that he really says there's two, right? It's love God and love others. But within that verse, he's also love, love, you know, treat others the way you want to be treated. Um, and essentially, what he's saying is, love God, love others, but also learn to love yourself. And this is not a, a self righteous love. This is not a love thinking I'm perfect and I love me. But it's a it's a recognizing God created you to be you and embracing that, embracing who God created you to be. And loving who he is, or loving who he is, and loving yourself in him, right? Um, and but because of his, because of his the decision to sin against Jesus by betraying him, Judas is unable to love himself, and he's unable to see God's love being re extended to him. I, I firmly believe Jesus would have forgiven Judas in the same way he forgiven he had forgiven Peter, but Judas was unable to see it, and un, and, and because he was unable to see it, he was unwilling to seek it. Now. Whether a person never accepts Jesus or they accept him but then choose to turn away, either decision leads to eternal judgment. Jesus is the only means of salvation. But the tragedy of a believer who turns away is that they made it through the gateway to eternal life and then decided that hope was not enough. And this is not because God was not God has failed to provide what a person needs to stay on the path. It is God has given them what they need, and they have rejected it. Either because they, they, they tried it for a while, and it got hard, and they thought, well, this Christianity thing doesn't work, so I'm going to try something else. Or it's because I don't know, they, they perceived God didn't give them what they needed. But again, God always provides exactly what we need when we need it. And he's provided us the greatest gift of all, right? It's, it's, it's whole, it, his Holy Spirit living in us through our faith in Jesus. All right, verses 7 and 8. The ground receives a blessing from God when it drinks up the rain that regularly comes, and it falls on it and yields a useful crop for those people for whom it's being farmed. But if it produces thorns and thistles, it's useless and close to being cursed. It ends up being burned. So these, these verses immediately draw to mind the parables of Jesus. A seed has been planted in the soil, and that soil is expected to yield a crop. So to aid in the process, God sends the rain to help water the seed in the soil. Just as the earth needs rain, so man needs the grace of God. Whether or not the seed receives the, sun, the rain or sunlight depends largely on the type of soil where it's planted. Is a person ready to receive the grace from God that will lead them to maturity? And again, we read the parable of the sower. We, we read about how the, the different types of soil in that parable Jesus tells. And we read about the good soil, and that's ultimately what we all want to be, is the good soil where the seed falls and it grows. And as the grace rains on it, it grows up. But some some of our hearts are the pathway. Some of us are the rocky soil. Some of us are the soil that's covered in thistles and bushes. But here's the reality. When we stop and think about that parable, soil doesn't make itself good. It can't do it. Soil is just soil, right? I mean, things have to happen to change its condition, whether that's a flood, whether it's a fire, whether whether it's someone intervenes, right? It, if you want to plant something on a, in a path where a pathway exists as a person, you have to tear the pathway up and, and, and work that soil to make it usable soil. If you want to use soil where bushes are growing, someone has to come along and cut the bushes out. Uh, if, if someone wants to... To, to use soil where there's rocks at, they have to come and remove all the rocks first. And while all of us want to believe that we started off as good soil, many of us, we actually started off with one of the other types. But th through the graciousness of God, whether that's in our own lives, or whether it's through the lives of God's faithful servants around us that came and helped clear the bushes and remove the rocks and dig up the pathway... Over time, our, our heart was made into good soil. It's only once our heart is made into good soil that we're ready to receive the grace that God has to, to offer us that leads us into maturity. So how does a person receive this grace? How, how does someone grow, get, receive grace to grow like this? Well, it's through the preaching, teaching, and reading of the Bible. The heart of a person is soil ready to produce when it drinks this rain when he understands what he hears and is affected by it. 
Now, there are external factors that may keep a person from hearing and understand it, but the biggest enemy to our spiritual growth is not outside external factors. Our biggest enemy to our spiritual growth is our own egos and pride. It's an inability, it's a, it's not an, it's a, it's an, it's an, not having a desire to want to grow. It's, it's exactly what the writer of Hebrews is right, warning these Hebrew Christians about. It's, it's a laziness. If you want to grow in your faith with Jesus, get plugged into a church. God is faithful where his word is being taught. Despite the gifts and the talents of the speaker or the teacher, where his word is being taught, it will yield what it's supposed to. God doesn't let his word return void. God will speak. We have to put ourselves in position. Uh, I can't remember what chapter of the study it was in, but there was a point where, um, maybe it wasn't even the study, but I heard a quote from someone that said that that to reject going to church is to reject God's plan for your discipleship. Hey, I know churches aren't perfect. Our, Rav Naz, I love the folks here. There's great folks here. Great things are happening here. But we're not perfect. But we're striving to be. We're striving to grow in the grace of God and grow closer to Him. But if you want to grow closer to God, get plugged into a fellowship. And, and, and maybe you're not ready to take that step yet. That's okay. Maybe you've been hurt by churches in the past, and, and I understand that. I get that. But nowadays, you can get plugged into a church without even having to be stepped through the doors first. You know, I'm not the only one putting Christian videos up like this, right? There's all kinds of churches doing things like this. Listen to the different teachers. Wrestle with what God's what they're what they're saying God's word says and and what God's saying to you through that teaching. And you will grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. You'll take that step in maturity. Now, regardless of whether we receive the message or reject it, that decision produces results in our lives. Dr. Jer- David Jeremiah notes that those who tend to their faith produce fruit, while those who ignore matters of faith produce nothing but thorns. And kind of, you know, if you meet a bitter Christian, it's it's a Christian that is refusing to practice forgiveness, though the grace to do so is available. Right, and we can go through the different struggles that we have as believers. But it's not because the, the, the grace of God is insufficient. It's because we lack understanding or we lack um, taking the steps that God's pointing us to. The grace is available. We have to be willing to seek it and to live in what we find and accept what God reveals to us. The failure to grow is not the result of insufficient funds but our failure to seek the funds available. God's grace is available to all of us, and it's sufficient for all of us, so we should seek after it. Well, that's all I got for this week. I hope I hope uh, this video has blessed you. Let me pray for you. Dear God, I thank you for the truth of your word, and I pray, Lord, that you would give us all a hunger and thirst for your righteousness, a hunger and thirst to, to, to know you more. Make that our deepest desire. God, you've already revealed to us how much you love us when you sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. You've already revealed to us the power that's made available through our faith in him, through the power of his resurrection, and through your gift of the Holy Spirit to us. So Lord, help us to, 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 to continue to seek to understand what that means, and not just understand it with our minds, but to accept it in our hearts. And through the grace of your Spirit with us, help us to be able to live it out and to be your lights to the world. It's in the name of Jesus I pray, amen. Well, God bless you, and we'll speak to you next time.